Good morning, church, family and friends here in the sanctuary and those tuning in. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Thank you. Jesus Christ, the risen King, His perfect love never changes. His mercies never cease. What a privilege it is for us to belong to Him. Come, people of the risen King, let us now rise and praise His name. Shifting shadows on 
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, indeed we rejoice in you, O Lord. And as we gather in your presence today, we come before you with humble hearts, acknowledging our so- your sovereignty over all creation. Lord, thank you for the blessings you have bestowed upon us, for this gift of life, and for the freedom to worship you without fear. Lord, in your word says in Psalm 146 verse 2, I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Indeed, O Lord, we will praise you because you are sovereign and you reign. Right now, O Lord, as we think about Christ's sacrifice on the cross, Father, we humble ourselves before you in repentance of our sins. Lord, we acknowledge the times we have broken your laws and failed to love our neighbours as ourselves. We pray that, Father, you will forgive us. And now, family, let's now take a moment before our God um, to come before him and confess our sins. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, indeed, we ask for your guidance and your wisdom as we navigate the challenges of this world. Father, grant us discernment to distinguish truth from falsehood and strength to stand firm in our faith amidst a culture that often opposes your word. Lord, teach us how to imitate Christ's humility, to do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that we may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Even as we look to the world, Lord, we want to pray for our nation and also all the leaders in the world, oh Lord, that they may govern with integrity and uphold the values that honour you. Lord, grant them wisdom and courage to make decisions that align with your will and promote justice and righteousness. First Timothy chapter 2 verses 1 to 2, I just ask to pray for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life godly and dignified in every way. And so, Father, with much, with much hope and faith, we pray that all people will come to a knowledge of truth and the love of Christ and come to know of your saving grace. As we look to ourselves, Lord, we lift up our families and our loved ones to you. Lord, we pray that we will become beacons of light and love in our homes, reflecting your grace and compassion to those around us. Father, strengthen marriages, heal broken relationships, and protect, Lord, our children from harm. Father, indeed, we pray and intercede for our young people. Lord, we ask that they will have an undivided heart for you and your, and your word, O oh Lord. Lord, to love you, to live for you, and to walk in righteous paths. Lord, truly, may they become like Timothy, who set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. That is our prayer, O oh Lord. And Father, lastly, for our church community here, Father, we intercede for those who are suffering, um, be it physically, emotionally, or spiritually. Father, you ask that you comfort the brokenhearted, Lord, you heal the sick, and you bring hope to the despairing. Lord, may your presence, your comfort be felt in every trial and tribulation, reminding us that you are our shepherd and you are always near. And Lord, lastly, as we are in the midst of our mission release here, Father, we pray that you unite us in heart, in fellowship, and in purpose, and empower us, O Lord, to fulfill the Great Commission with boldness and conviction. May our lives be a testimony to your goodness and grace, drawing others into relationship with you. We pray your word in 1 Thessalonians 3. May the Lord make our love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you, Lord. May God strengthen our hearts so that we will be blameless and holy in the presence of God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. In all things, O Lord, may your name be glorified. And so we submit our prayers to you, trusting in your faithfulness and your unfailing love. And let's now say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Grace. Good morning, BMC, and welcome to our 8.30 service. Today, you'll be seeing familiar faces, but not the usual faces from our normal 8.30 service. So before we dive into family news, do we have any newcomers in our midst? You can raise your hands. And should we have newcomers at home, you may scan the QR code, but you don't have to raise your hands. Yeah. Okay, so that our ushers and our befriending team can be in touch with you. So now we do our usual, we rise to our feet and we greet everybody. Pass the peace of God. Okay, let's take our seats. The first family news we have for today is prayer watch. So we will be having our prayer watch this coming Tuesday at our usual venue, ROL. So even though ROL is under renovation, you can be accessed the room through the, uh, through the side doors that's on the same side as the glass door. So if those who have not explored the church for a while, you go up to level 3, ROL door is closed, it's sealed. Okay, so go to the wooden door beside. And don't be shy, just come in. Okay? So we hope to see all of you there for a time of worship, sharing and intercession. Next up. Parenting teenager course. So I remember just going through the terrible tools with my son, my eldest son. And now he's already a teenager. He's set one this year. We face challenges and some are finding it a struggle trying to communicate with our kids, trying to understand them beyond their physical changes. So this is for us. So if you have friends or you know of someone who have teenage kids, do encourage them to sign up for this class. It's 100% on Zoom. So the $20 that you're paying for is mainly for the course materials. And it's starting every Wednesday from 8th of May till 5th of June. Okay, so you can scan the QR code or you can refer to Oikos or our website. The third family news we have is Mother's Day lunch. So we are delighted to have Pastor Henry Chong to share and sing with us this Mother's Day. The event is on 4th of May and let us now take a look at who Pastor Henry is and what's his ministry about.
、我的房子、我的车子，因为我都没有，所以有的你一定比我多。但是有一件事情，我可以很肯定的说，我的灵魂绝对比你丰富，因为我走遍了全世界，我唱遍了全世界，我看遍了全世界，我的生命是一首首的歌，也是一张一张、一字一句的生命之字，写下了我人生的经历。弟兄姊妹们，这番话，如果你读圣经，你看保罗的生命。看门徒的生命，他们的确也是如此活过来的，不是吗？如今能够亲眼看见他。So Pastor Henry, he warms the hearts of many Mandarin-speaking seniors. He was a singer in the 80s. And at the peak of his career, he answered God's call into ministry. Um, so since then, he has been an evangelistic singer since 1987, at the peak of his career. He's an anointed preacher, and his sharing is never dull. He will surely value at your lunch experience through his songs. So this is an opportunity for you to invite your pre-believing family and friends to the event. It's not only for mothers, okay? Yeah, family can gather together to celebrate and just reach out to the unsaved. Only at forty dollars, you get to enjoy an afternoon of good food. It's an eight-course lunch, okay? Nice singing and some sharing, almost like a wedding banquet. So good things must share, as Brother Ho Yong always say. Mai Tu Liao. Okay, sign up today. You can scan the QR code above or. Hop down to their、um, booth at the fellowship deck between the services. Lastly, bring joy to Crystalite Methodist Home. Join our very enthusiastic seniors and bring joy to the home. Special shout out for singers. Don't worry, this is not the voice. Okay, we need your voice only. So if you can sing or hold a tune, do join them for practice on 11th of April, 7:45, Matthew Room. Matthew Room is at level three. Okay, so for more information, do contact Hui Hua, and her number is on the screen. Okay, that's the end of our family news. So now it's giving. Let us let me lead us in prayer for giving to the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning, lifting up the upcoming up outreach and equipping events into your hands. Lord, we pray for open hearts and attentive ears to come and hear and experience you. We pray for a personal encounter with you for them, and many may they may the seeds sown blossom in your time. And even as we offer our gifts at the altar, we pray that you will please you will be pleased and you will use them for the furtherance of your kingdom's work in BMC and beyond. In Jesus' name, Amen. Please stand for the doxology.
receive the teaching of the word. May God breathe on, on us and fill us with life anew. Breathe on me, breath of God. Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, last week was Holy Week, and it was very tiring for our pastors with five services within two days and one night. So after Holy Week, when the clergy is exhausted, the laity is activated. But pastors deserve a well-earned break at the retreat, and I'm thankful at Bedok Methodist Church the clergy and the laity work together as a team, one body in Christ. I used to joke that uh, on this Sunday when pastors are not around, remember, pastors' wives are still around. <laughs> That's a joke, okay? But we really work very well as a team here together. This morning, I come to you not with superior speech or persuasive words, but I pray in demonstration of the spirit and power so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of man, but on the power of God. Because the whole of last week, my prayer for all of us has been that when the word of God is preached today, it will not be an idle word for you. This is taken from Deuteronomy 32, verses 46 to 47. Why? Because the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-aged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the intentions and the thoughts of our hearts. So this is really my prayer that this morning as I preach the Word of God from John chapter 20, that His Word will take effect in our lives. It will transform us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank You that we can come this morning to worship You and to glorify Your name. So we ask, Lord, speak, that we, Your people, might listen and obey. Let your word take effect in our hearts. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within us, that we will be called children of God. So we thank you that your presence is here with us. So come, Lord, minister to us in a very personal way. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Gospel of John. This is uh, the sermon title, Our Resurrected Christ, His Peace, Power and purpose, taken from John chapter 20, verses 19 to 29. So, if you have your Bible with you, please turn to John chapter 20 uh, and check me out on the verses, okay? Because my words are not important, but scripture is very important. So, the gospel 
is a very interesting and different kind of literature. It is not a biography. It is not history. It is, in fact, it has a genre of a news bulletin. It is almost as if it's earth-shattering news that can transform our lives. I mean, last Wednesday, we heard of earth-shattering news, like earthquakes in Taiwan and Japan. So the gospel is something like that. It's like a news bulletin that has to be announced to the whole world. Now, the gospel of John was written to more mature believers in Christ. Because if you look at the last verse 31 of John 20, it says, these have been written so that you may believe. So these are believers, so that you may believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God. And that believing, you believe and you go on believing, you may have life in his name. So the Gospel of John is written for more mature believers. And it's the last of the Gospel to be written somewhere between A.D. 85 and A.D. 95. So since it is a news bulletin, and news bulletins are meant to be read aloud, I would invite all of us to read 11 verses from John chapter 20, verse 19 to verse 29. But now there are three groups of people who actually read the Bible. You can categorize them as, number one, those who read the Bible for themselves, usually a verse or two as part of their daily bread devotion. Okay? And then those who read the Bible for others, teachers and preachers of the Word read the Bible for others. And we read passages and we study the context. But there is a third group, those who read the Bible to know God. So this morning, I pray as we read these verses, we will belong to the third group. We will read God's Word really to know who Jesus is. Okay, so let's read John chapter 20, verse 19 to 29. Verse 19, let's read together. So when it was evening on that day, This is the word of the Lord. Give yourself a round of applause. You did so well. I didn't even have to read with you. Excellent. But really, we want to read the Bible to know the God that we believe in. Now, when someone important and or all famous die, usually interest in this person develop in stages. And Jesus is certainly one person who qualifies as important and famous. You know, there are at least 250 names and titles accorded to Jesus. And it's interesting that if you look at the four gospels, 
they are somehow linked to these stages of development of interest in an important person. Usually when someone dies, someone famous or important dies, the first level is really what did the person do? What did Jesus do? And if you read the Gospel of Mark, which incidentally is the first Gospel to be recorded, you find that in the Gospel of Mark, this word immediately, straight away, in some uh, version, straight away, this word appears 51 times in the four gospel, but 41 out of the 51 times, 80% were recorded in the gospel according to Mark. You know, the gospel of Mark emphasized what Jesus did. Immediately, immediately you find this word, you know. And then the gospel of Matthew and Luke emphasize what Jesus said. After you know what the person did, you want to know what did this person say. And so what Jesus said, and you find in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, it's recorded for us a lot of parables, kingdom parables about the kingdom of God, the lifestyle of the kingdom, the missions of the kingdom, the growth of the kingdom, the community of the kingdom, and the future of the kingdom, the, the coming of Jesus again. So you find that what Jesus said was recorded in the Gospel of Matthew and Luke. And when we come to this last gospel which was recorded, the gospel of John, this interest in this famous person shifted to who this person was, who Jesus was. And that's why you find in the gospel of John, you have these seven I am's. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the ship. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and I am the true vine. So when you come to this last stage, you know, wanting to know more about this person, it's really who is this person, who Jesus was. And that's my prayer for us, for all of us today, that as we delve into John 20, verses 19 to 29, we begin to know who really is Jesus, our Lord whom we believe in. So what Jesus did, what Jesus said, who Jesus was. Now, if you want an outline of my sermon, a quick overview, this is it. All right, so if you want to take a picture of this, this is the flow that I'm following uh, for my sermon this morning. Okay, so John chapter 20, beginning with verse 19. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, when the disciples were, where the disciples were, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, peace be with you. Now, John chapter 20, verse 19 tells us that it was evening on that day, the first day of the week. Right? And incidentally, the first day of the week for them is Sunday. So it was the evening of that day, the first day of the week. But what happened on Sunday morning? So let's backtrack to John chapter 19 to see what had happened earlier. Actually, today's sermon is post resurrection. We've gone through the whole of last week, the Holy Week. This is post-resurrection. But let's backtrack a little bit to see what happened before we come to verse 19 that says, it was evening on that day, the first day of the week. Now, it's very interesting that the first day of the week is on a Sunday and where we worship God together. So for us, this should really be the first day of the week. You know, uh, the, the world has gotten it wrong for those in the world, they believe that Monday is the first day of the week. So Sunday becomes the last day. And by the time they finish the week, they are so tired, they have no more energy to worship God on a Sunday. But actually for us, Sunday is the first day. We start the week by worshipping God, the first day of the week. So let's backtrack a little bit. Now you'll find that in John chapter 19, verse 30, we know that Jesus had been crucified. Right? Jesus had been crucified. And then in John chapter 19, verse 42, it says, Therefore, because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Now, if you have a Bible with you, check me out. I'll scroll up a little bit higher. Uh, in verse 31 of John chapter 19, verse 31 of John chapter 19, it says, Then the Jews, because it was the day of preparation, so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath. Right? They didn't want the body to remain on the cross on the Sabbath. But if you read 
verse 31 of John chapter 19, that's a, that's a parenthesis that says, for that Sabbath was a high day. Now, that's an interesting uh, uh, comment there. For that Sabbath was a high day. So this was not the usual weekly Sabbath that they observed. This was a high Sabbath. And a high Sabbath, according to the tradition, is one that coincided with one of the feasts. And in this case, the Passover feast. Right? So this was a special Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, and therefore they didn't want the body to remain there. So they took down Jesus' body, there was a tomb nearby, and they laid Jesus there. And then you turn over to John chapter 20, you now begin to see in verse 1, the empty tomb. The first day of the week, remember? Mary Magdalene and some women came early to the tomb. In fact, while it was still dark, while it was still dark, some commentators say it's about 6 a.m. in the morning. So this is a Sunday morning. They were rushing to the empty tomb. Uh, of course, they didn't know it was empty then. They rushed to the tomb, uh, Mary, Mary Magdalene and the women, and they came to, to the tomb. It was early. It was still dark. And they saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So the stone was rolled away. So they were surprised. Mary, in verse 2, says, ran to tell Simon Peter. So Mary was shocked. She ran to tell Simon Peter. And, check this out in your Bible, the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Who is this other disciple whom Jesus loved? Of course, we know it's the disciple John himself. Okay? And then so Peter and the other disciple went forth. It's very interesting how the Bible records for us. Right? Why, why doesn't it say Simon Peter and John. Why it says, uh, Mary ran to tell Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved. And in verse 3, it says, Peter and the other disciple went forth. And they were going to the tomb. And the two were running together. And the other disciple, we now know it's John, ran ahead faster than Peter. And he came to the tomb first. And stopping and looking in, he saw that the linen wrapping was lying there, but he which is John, the other disciple, did not go in. Right? Peter entered in the tomb before John. So John, John uh, didn't go in first. Peter was the one who went in first, although John arrived at the tomb earlier than Peter. Now, why the Bible records for us? I mean, John is the author of this gospel. Why did he say the other disciple? You know, in all of the gospel recordings, if you read, almost the authors didn't want to mention themselves. They, they always say the disciple whom Jesus loved, you know, because they want, perhaps for us, when we read this gospel account, to focus on Jesus himself. And really, we read the word of God to know who Jesus is. And so the other disciple in verse 8 again, uh, John chapter 20, verse 8, the other disciple whom we now know is John, who had first come to the tomb, she, he ran ahead before Peter, he came to the tomb, but he didn't enter, Peter rushed in. Peter was the, the one who is uh, impetuous, he was the one who got into action first. And then John later entered and he saw and believed. And as yet, they did not understand the scripture that Jesus must rise again from the dead. They didn't understand that. They knew it was gone. You know, they thought, Mary thought someone must have stolen uh, Jesus away. And so the disciples went away back to their homes. And then in verse 17, you find that Jesus said to Mary, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my father and your father. Again, this is very interesting if you read it in detail. I ascend to my father and your father, and my God and your God. So what does this make all of us? We are really brothers and sisters in Christ. right? Because uh, this is what Jesus said. And then in verse 18, Mary Magdalene came, announcing to the disciples, I've seen the Lord, and that he has said these things to her. And so we come to verse 19, then it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut. When the doors were shut. So what did Jesus do? What did Jesus do? When the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood in their midst. Now, Jesus was not a ghost. You know, he wasn't one of those flying around like, you know, or he wasn't a force. He's a person, right? Jesus was not a ghost. How do we know that? Because in verse 20, uh, he said this to them, Peace be with you. And he showed them both his hands. 
he showed them both his hands and his side. Now, which side? Is it the right side or the left side? I don't know. The Bible didn't say. The okay, commentator says probably it's the right side because when the soldiers pierce, they pierce through the right side to his heart on the left. But he showed them both his hands. Right? And so, he wasn't a ghost. He's a person in a certain form. And in verse 27, of course, he said to Thomas, reach here with your finger and see my hands. And reach here your hand and put it in my side. Right? So Jesus was in the ghost. But the doors were shut. He could somehow walk through it or he just appeared. He came and he stood in their midst. The point is, Jesus could go where no one else could. Jesus could go where no one else could. Are there places where you need Jesus to go where your counsellors, or your doctors could not go? You know, sometimes medical science can only go so far, but Jesus could go further than that. I have an experience. In January, uh, on the 3rd to 8th of January 2020, I was down with dengue uh, because where I stayed, there was the second highest hotspot with 171 cases. You know, so I was hospitalised for five days. Uh, thank God, uh, I was treated by Dr. Leong, you know, the uh, very qualified infectious disease specialist. And when he treated me, he says, uh, you know, could you cooperate with me on three things? Because there's no medication for dengue, you know that, right? There's no medication for dengue. Of course, some people say, uh, you know, boy, the papaya leaves and all that. <laughs> there's no medication for dengue. So he says, you just cooperate with me on three things, Ken? I say, okay, what are they? Number one, complete rest in bed. You can't even get down from the hospital bed. You know, five days I was there. By the fifth day, I cannot tahan already. <laughs> I asked for earlier this release, <laughs> discharge, you know. So, complete rest in bed. Okay. And then number two, uh, we'll put a drip and we will hydrate you with, with all the other stuff. Okay, we'll hydrate. That's okay. And I say, what's the third? He says, the third is very simple. You pray. Now, he's a medical doctor, a specialist, highly qualified in infectious disease, but he's a believer too, right? He's from one of our Methodist churches in the CAC. So he says, you pray. Are there places where Jesus could go, where your doctors or even your counsellors could not? Jesus did that. When the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood in their midst. You know, there's no one else like Jesus. Alive, resurrected, alive. Truly God and truly man. Not a ghost, not a force, not a kind of a floating spirit. A person. Truly God, truly man. So what does this tell us? Isaiah records for us in 45 verse 6, the Lord himself said that there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. Would you trust in Jesus as your Lord? Would you spend that time studying the Word to know who Jesus really is? You know, I get a kick out of it every time I study the Word of God. And it helps me understand who Jesus is. Because it builds biblical conviction in me. That I know this is the Lord whom I believe in. So what did Jesus do? When the doors were shut, He came and stood in their midst. And then, of course, what else? The disciples were fearful of the Jews. They were afraid. They were really afraid. That's why the doors were shut. You know, their fear was totally understandable because Jesus, their leader, had just been crucified as a threat to Caesar. Now, actually, the trial of Jesus was never fair. The trial of Jesus was never fair. Why? Because Jesus had been charged by the chief priests and the religious leaders for blasphemy, for calling himself out to be God, all right? So he was charged for that. But by the time the chief priests and the religious leaders brought Jesus before Pontius Pilate, they changed the charge. They changed it to one of treason because now they say Jesus called himself king of the Jews, all right? So they just suka suka, they changed the charge, right? Because for the Romans government, if you claim to be a king, then you are a threat to Caesar. 
And so their religious leader, Jesus, had just been crucified for being a threat to Caesar, and now the disciples were fearful. And that's why they were inside gathered together and the doors were shut. But Jesus came and stood in their midst. So their fears are understandable, but the point is, again, Jesus came to them in the midst of their fear. Jesus comes to us when we are afraid. What are your fears? Individually? What are the fears of us as a congregation at Bedok Methodist Church? You know, in the leadership, we, we have some concerns, fears, and we pray over them. We fear the worldly philosophies and false teaching and doctrines, false doctrines will creep into our church, you know, and cause divisions, cause strife. Those are our fears. What are your fears? Maybe, for me, it's the fear of being disqualified in the faith journey, especially for those of us who are teachers and preachers. There's always this fear that having preached to others, we ourselves will be disqualified. And you have seen many, uh, you know, teachers and preachers who have fallen from grace into grace. But that could be a fear too. But you know, there's something greater than the fear. And that is the grace of God. I'm a, one person who really enjoy attending uh, our year-end Wesleyan Covenant service, what we call the Watch Night service. And I remember last year, uh, I actually had an invitation uh, to attend a friend's uh, daughter's wedding dinner. Uh, but this is one of those dinners where you start from 7 p.m., it goes all the way to 1 a.m. with a countdown and all that, you know, at Akaf Mansion. So I told my friend I'll attend, but I'll leave early. I'll leave early because I want to come back to BMC here for watch night service. And when we come for watch night service, I love coming before the Lord, you know, before the start of the new year. Remember, it's like uh, the, the, the first day of the week. Before the start of the new year, I come before God and say, Lord, I need you. I need your grace. And I know you will come and you will stand in the midst of my fears. You will empower me. And so, Lord, I come before you and I, I commit all the days of my life into your hands. So that's a very meaningful service. And uh, if you have never attended Watch Night Service, I encourage you, come this year. Come and attend Watch Night Service. What did Jesus do? Jesus came when the doors were shut. Jesus stood in the, in the, in the midst of their fears. Jesus stood in their midst. Verse 19 tells us, the, the disciples were fearful of the Jews, but Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, peace be with you. Jesus stood in their midst. Jesus wasn't distant from them. He wasn't from outside the room, you know, from a far corner. Hello, I'm here. Look at me. No, he came and he stood in their midst. He knew they were fearful and that's why he was there. Jesus wasn't distant from them. Jesus isn't distant from us here today either. Jesus is here, right here, right now. You know, sometimes in our discussion, some people ask, you know, uh, in your spiritual walk, how far are you away from God? Uh, are you like 50 meter, 500 meter? You know, one kilometer, five kilometer. I think that, that uh, analogy, that illustration is, is not quite correct. Because if you look at Psalms 139, verse 7 to 10, the psalmist says, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in shore, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there, your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. God's presence is with us. Jesus stood in the midst of them. God's presence is with us. We can't run away. Well, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Yes, in the sense of your worship, 
in the sense of your praise of Him, in the sense of your prayers. Yes, draw near. Never for a moment think that your absence from Sunday worship service doesn't matter. I'm so happy, you know. I'll, I'll be happier if uh, when, when we say, are there newcomers? Well, there'll be more hands up than all of us. Right? But I'm happy that we are regular worshippers here because your presence is an encouragement to a fellow brother and sister. Right? So never underestimate that. And that's the whole meaning of ongoing, personal, intimate relationship with Jesus. That's what it means. I'm learning that in this season of my life. I'm studying now Ezekiel. And you know, Ezekiel is a prophet. And uh, God told him, you know, uh, Ezekiel, I want you to prepare a meal and bake it using uh, uh, human excreta as fuel. <laughs> and Ezekiel said, no, 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 I can't do that. That's, that's, that's defiled. I can't do that. And then God says, okay, then uh, maybe you use cow dung as fuel. <laughs> it's a kind of a conversation between God and His people. That's the ongoing, personal, intimate relationship with Jesus. I urge you, I implore you, get to know Jesus, who He really is to you. Right? That's Jesus for us. What did He do? The first thing. Now, the next thing is what Jesus said. Jesus said, peace be with you. In verse 19, we read that. He says, peace be with you. And so our resurrected Christ gives us His peace. His peace. Peace be with you is repeated three times in verse 19, verse 21, where He says to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And then of course in verse 26, uh, reading from verse 24, but Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciple, remember, the other disciple, that's John himself, right, was saying to him, we have seen, uh, this is the other disciples, all of the disciples were saying to him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, very interesting, huh? why eight days? From Sunday to Sunday. After eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. And Jesus came, the doors having shut. Again, the doors were shut. And stood in their midst. Jesus came to them again and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger and see my hands. I was having an interesting uh, discussion with some of our brothers here uh, yesterday. When, when Jesus told uh, Thomas, you know, doubting Thomas, uh, uh, that reach here with your finger and see my hands. How do you think Jesus' hands look like? Is there a scar? Is there a lobang? And, and, where, and where is that scar or the lobang? Is it on the wrist or on the, on the hand, on the palm? But Jesus said that, right? I mean... Okay, this is a moot point, like, just for, for curiosity's sake. The Bible will never say anything about But really, Thomas saw something. Because in verse uh, 29, Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see. We are the ones who did not see Jesus, and yet believe. We are called blessed. You know, but it's very interesting, right? When Jesus showed the hands and the side, come, put your finger here, you know, see. Then, then the question I have in mind is then the resurrected body is not perfect, right? <laughs> we, we always think the resurrected body is perfect, right? Is, is the Bible contradictory? No, the Bible is never contradictory. The Bible never says the resurrected body is perfect. The Bible says there is a resurrection of the dead. It is sown perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown in natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. And that mark, that imprint on Jesus' hand is sown in dishonor, but it is raised in glory. It is because of that nail mark that sent Him to the cross to die for us that we now enjoy eternal life with Him. 
That's a beauty, isn't it? What did Jesus said? Peace with you three times. And this is His peace to us. Jesus Himself is our peace. How do I know that? Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 to 18. For He Himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in His flesh. See the hands, in His flesh, the dividing wall of hostility. Because sinful man cannot come to a holy God. You know, I told you I'm studying Ezekiel. And, and in those days, the people of God were so rebellious, they were so sinful, that the glory of the God began to depart from the temple. Because where sin is, the holy God cannot be there. God is light and in Him there's no darkness. And so here it says, Jesus has broken down the wall, the dividing wall of hostility and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Jesus himself is our peace. If you are not convinced, John chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Our resurrected Christ gives us His peace. John 16, verse 33, These things I've spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. We only have peace in Jesus alone, the Prince of Peace. So Jesus said, Peace be with you three times, and He Himself is our peace. So Jesus initiates peace with God for us, by offering himself on the cross. That's the beauty of it. That's what Jesus said. And he meant every word that he said. Peace be with you. My peace I give to you. Uh, John Piper elaborated on that to say that the peace offered by Jesus, actually there are five aspects to it. Peace between us and Jesus himself. And then peace between us and God through Jesus. He brought peace. Remember, he tore down the dividing wall of hostility all right, and reconciled us to God. Peace between us and other believers. Other believers. Galatians 3.28 There is neither Jews nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And we, we are really the beneficiaries. We are the Gentiles. I mean, the Jews are God's chosen people. We are the Gentiles, but we are crafted into this heritage, this blessing that we receive. Peace between us and our souls. Hebrews 9.14 How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? How much more? Think about that. The peace that Jesus offered to us, the peace that Jesus brought for us, reconciled us within our soul. And of course, the peace with the world. Ultimately, the peace will be established throughout the world. Isaiah 9, 7, we know this very famous one. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness. From then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. The world may be chaotic now. There may be tribulations. There may be earthquakes, famines, wars. Ultimately, there will be peace because Jesus offered His peace to us. What did Jesus say? Peace be with you. What else did Jesus say? Jesus said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. Our resurrected Lord said that. Receive the Holy Spirit. So, our resurrected Christ offered us His peace. Our resurrected Christ offers us His power. When He said, receive the Holy Spirit. In verse 22. Now, you might also want to check out John chapter 14. Uh, verse 16, 18, and 26, where Jesus said, I will ask the Father, and He will give you another helper, that He may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth. 
So, you know, Christ ascended to God in heaven and He didn't leave us as orphans. He gave us the Holy Spirit as our helper. Verse 18 says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Even as He has gone back to heaven, He will come back for us again. And verse 26, But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. So actually, Christ gave us His power through the Holy Spirit, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, you know, in Acts chapter 1, they were told to wait in Jerusalem, right? Gathering them together, Jesus commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised. And that is to be baptized with the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 1, verse 5. And then, you know, in Acts chapter 2, they were filled with the Holy Spirit at the day of Pentecost. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So, receive the Holy Spirit. They didn't, uh, they received the Holy Spirit, but the filling of the Holy Spirit came much later on the day of Pentecost. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 tells us, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. For you have not Romans 8.15 tells us you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. All of us as believers, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in us. That is His presence in us. All right? And the Spirit of God identifies with our spirit and we cried out, Abba, Father. That's why we are able to call God, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our own spirit that we are children of God. But not all believers are filled with the Spirit, and that is to have the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why Ephesians 5, 18 says, be filled with the Holy Spirit, and continue to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit will not leave us. God's presence is always with us, but we need to allow the Holy Spirit to take control. We need to allow Him to take preeminence in all of our daily Christian living. This is something I learned from the crusade, campus crusade, years back. Uh, you know, the four spiritual law is a yellow booklet. This is the blue booklet for believers. And the first sentence there, I still remember, it, every day can be an exciting adventure for the Christian who knows the reality of being filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's true. Remember, I talk about this ongoing, personal, intimate relationship with God. Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Last year, 5th March, in the century here, I, I was so moved by the presence of God. And 21st April, 21st April, back home in my own room, I prayed earnestly, God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Empower me. Nothing happened. And there was no lightning, you know, I, I wasn't like slain or what, nothing happened. I just prayed, nothing happened. But by the time I went to the church camp, something happened. I knew that although the temptations were there, the propensity to sin diminishes. And then on 26 August, when we have the Holy Spirit seminar, something happened at that seminar. I received the gift of speaking in tongues. Right? That's being filled with the Holy Spirit. Part of it is, part of it is the, the Spirit taking preeminence that we know He's there to empower us. One of the very obvious ones, as I've said, is, you know, the propensity to sin diminish. I'm not talking about the occasion, occasional sinning in temptations, but about the power of the Holy Spirit to help us overcome strongholds, what some people call habitual sin, stronghold. And you need to fight that, and the Holy Spirit is able to do that. And you know, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you will exhibit the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And the fruit of the Holy Spirit in Galatians 5, 22, 23 is love, joy, peace, patient, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And against such thing, there is no law. What did Jesus say? Receive the Holy Spirit. What else did He say? He said, As the Father has sent me, I also sent you. In verse 21, as the Father has sent me, I also sent you. Our resurrected Christ establishes His purpose for our Christian living. He offered us His peace, 
He offered us His power and He establishes the purpose of our Christian living. As the Father has sent me, I also sent you. So we are really ambassadors for Christ. We, as in 2 Corinthians 5.20. And so if we are ambassadors for Christ, we need to bring this good news to others. Don't forget, BMC Shine Mission Summit is on from 13 to 15 June this year. So if you have a calendar, please lock it in now. All right? Uh, you just need to take half a day leave because it starts on the Thursday night. Friday is from 1 p.m. to 9 p.m. And then Saturday is a morning session. So BMC Shine Mission Summit is here. We are ambassadors. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God was making an appeal through us. We back you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. Jesus has said, as the Father has sent me, I also sent you. We are his ambassadors and we must preach the word. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reproof, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. Preach the word. Share the good news. Get it out to those who need it most. We can't hoard it to ourselves. We can't. Now, how difficult can it be sharing the good news? It's not that difficult if we are simply bearing witness to what Christ has done in our lives. We are His witnesses. Remember Acts 1.8, but you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and even to the outermost part of the world. You know, sometimes when we talk about missions, you know, I, I think some people, mission, mission is not for me. Lah. Mission is for those more serious ones. You, know, you go cross-cultural missions and all that. But then we are called to be His witnesses. And on the other side is personal evangelism. Right? But personal evangelism and missions are, are kind of linked together. Because you shall be my witnesses. You shall share this good news. Bear witness. Both in Jerusalem, where you are, among your families, among your loved ones. Uh, you just saw the announcement just now, right? 4th May, Pastor Henry Chong, right? Is going to share through music and God's word, Mother's Day's Lunch. And I think Joanna just said, not just for mothers, uh, bring, bring your loved ones who have yet to receive Christ. And we have good turnout, I must say, usually. More, uh, in those occasions, more pre-believing friends than the believers. And that's a good thing, right? So remember, do that, do that. What did Jesus say? Peace be with you. The opposite of peace is conflict. Receive the Holy Spirit, His power. The opposite of power is weakness. And as the Father has sent me, I also send you His purpose for us. The opposite of purpose is aimlessness. Many lives are destroyed by conflict, weaknesses, and aimlessness. But Jesus came to save us, not to destroy us. He came to give us an abundant life. And that's why the conclusion of John chapter 20 says, Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. What Jesus did, what Jesus said, now who Jesus was. The only conclusion is Jesus is our loving Saviour because His peace reconciled us to God He's our friend because He gives us an helper. He doesn't leave us as often. The Holy Spirit, He gives us as our helper, our comforter. And He's our Lord because He commands us that we are His ambassadors of the kingdom of God. And that's interesting. And I'll end with John chapter 13, verse 1. Now, before the feast of the Passover, Jesus knew that His hour had come, that He would depart out of this world to the Father. Having loved His own, Having loved his disciples who were in the world, he loved them to the end. That's our loving Lord. He will love us to the end. You can rest assured, he is for us. Even as we are comforted by his peace in the midst of conflicting situations, even as we are asked to stay connected to the Holy Spirit to receive his power, and even as we are commissioned to preach the word, to a world that desperately needs to hear the gospel. 
this morning I pray that you will know who Jesus is, that Jesus loves you and he will love you to the end. That's amazing. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have spoken. We have received your word. Lord, I ask that your word will take effect in our lives and help us really to grow in Christ more and more to know who you really are. Lord, we thank you for such blessing you have bestowed upon us. Your love, your peace, your power, that we will be called children of God. Thank you, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. May our lives be renewed as we, as we yield to the Holy Spirit and become more and more like Jesus. Church, please stand for the song of dedication. Holy Spirit, living breath of God. Church, as always, the altar is open for those who would like to have someone pray alongside you if there is a need in your life or to stand in the gap for someone else. So please come forward after the service. As pastors are not around today, let us sing the benediction together instead. Lord bless you and keep you make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you the lord turn his face toward